Yes, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity to present uh, my work here today also in the name of all um, collaborators. Uh, so in talking about rifting, of course, one of the key questions is well, what is what are the forces enabling the breakup of strong, thick and cold lithosphere? And usually this is discussed, discussed in the context, context of strain accommodation, whether it is controlled by faulting or magmatic processes or both. And so to illustrate this, I would like to start with a conceptual model of rifting in East Africa from James Moorhead. And so in the onset of rifting, we might see that um, in the crust, a brittle deformation is mostly located at border faults, and we might see isolated instances of magmatism and ductile deformation in the lithospheric mantle. And then as rifting uh, progresses um, and more and more melt becomes available due to decompression melting, we might see that activity shifts towards intra-rift faults and then um, magmatic segments um, occur later on when more and more melt becomes available until in the last stage, um, we see that new crust is formed um, here in spreading ridges. And so all of these processes actually enhance the frequency of seismic activity and then also drive the localization of strain. And so what I want to do today, I want to look at an example from the Natron Rift in East Africa. Uh, and the Natron Rift is located here within the North Tanzanian divergence at the very end of the Eastern branch of the East African Rift where rifting is at an early stage around 6 million years. And then this here in the red um, area is the Natron Rift. It's uh, about 3 million years old and includes the famous Aldonio Lengai volcano. And so why is this volcano famous? It's because it's the only active carbonatite volcano uh, on Earth. Uh, it's a small picture here. Um, eruption started 400,000 years ago, and it shows ongoing effusive carbonatite eruptions that are currently confined um, to the crater. However, uh, every once in a while, it erupts explosively. Uh, and this so happened in 2007 and 2008. And what was particularly interesting about this episode is that it was preceded by a dike intrusion at the neighboring um, Nibisoto volcanic field, which is at the southern area here at Gelai Shield Volcano. And this was seen in the form of a seismic swarm with over 70 earthquakes with magnitudes four and above, and also significant uh, deformation seen on INSAR. And so this has sparked a number of questions on the plumbing system of this rift. And I want to address those today here with new data from the SizeVault project. Um, stations were deployed um, from February 2019 to June 2020. You can see here that this is our station setup. This includes uh, all three um, volcanic areas. And so the earthquake locations that I present here today are, um, were obtained using Quake Migrate, which is a code from the Cambridge group. Uh, and we use a uh, non-linlock and a 3D velocity model from a prior study to obtain um, final locations. And so here I show seismicity patterns from March to December 2019. So this is 10 months of data. Uh, and overall, this is about uh, 6,800 volcano tectonic events. And you can see right away just from map view that most of the activity is actually happening beneath the volcanic centers. And so uh, we see currently uh, not much activity at the border fall, uh, as you can see. If we look um, at all of these earthquakes in the 3D volume for better visibility, and here I colored um, the earthquakes according to their depth, and then the size of the circles corresponds to the magnitude. Um, you can see that we have different clusters, for example, here beneath uh, Naiba Soto volcanic field. This is the deepest cluster that goes down to uh, nearly 20 kilometers depth. We see more shallow clusters here, um, and then um, also beneath um, Gelai volcano, this is the shallowest seismicity that we record in this area, that is mostly down to 10 kilometers, but we also image a lot of um, seismic gaps. So there's a really strong seismic gap between Naibasoto volcanic field as well as beneath um, Aldonio Lengai volcano. Um, if we look at magnitudes, um, we were able to locate really small magnitudes uh, due to the small station spacing. Um, so on um, minus uh, negative uh, 0.85 on the local magnitude scale and the biggest earthquake was 3.6. Our magnitude of completeness is quite low at around zero and our B value is 
is one. Um, if we look at how many earthquakes happen per day, we see something like 20 to 30, depending on how many stations were actually running. So whenever we had a lot of station downtimes, we also record uh, or we are able to um, get uh, fewer locations. However, we have some events that really stand out and those correspond to seismic swarms. And so the first seismic swarm happens in April on three consecutive days. And this actually corresponds to 260 events uh, beneath Galai Shield Volcano here. And we repick this data by hand uh, to get better locations and also focal mechanisms. And we can see that uh, seismicity is happening a sort of pipe-like pattern. And this largest earthquake here is the 3.6 I already mentioned. It happens quite early and quite deep. However, there's no clear progression in time from depth to the surface. Um, most of the focal mechanisms are more or less um, normal faulting events. And then the second seismic swarm happens on a single day uh, in October. And uh, this time, uh, the location is north of the Lai volcano. Um, however, just a few days before this swarm, our closest stations failed. So we did not uh, repick the data because we cannot improve the locations, really. And we can also not get focal mechanisms for this swarm. Um, speaking of focal mechanisms, in total, we derived 281, and this is from P um, polarity picks as well as uh, P to S uh, ratios. And so most of the events are um, strike, slip, and normal faulting. Um, but it's a bit, little bit surprising, maybe, that we see so many strike slips uh, in an extensional setting. If we look um, at these mechanisms on a map view, and here I show the best, fifth bestie, uh, 50 best. Uh, focal mechanisms, we find that um, normal faulting events here colored in red mostly occur beneath Galai volcano, while on the other hand, if we go over here to Olonyo Lengai, we only see strike slip events. And so overall, um, our attention axis direction, which is often taken as a proxy for extension, is more or less uh, northwest southeast, uh, similar to the um, closest uh, vector here for plate motion. If we look a bit more closely at these tension axis directions, we, um, we bin them into different depth groups to look more what's going on. And we can find that beneath Galai volcano, where we see more shallow seismicity, those are more or less uh, parallel to the regional extension. If we look at uh, what's happening beneath Nyber Soto volcanic field, where we saw these two clusters, also this very deep cluster, we find that these uh, axes are more chaotic or erratic. They don't really follow um, a pattern. And then when we look towards Odonyo Lengai volcano, we find that these tension axes sort of wrap around the edifice uh, itself. If we look at pressure axis, we find that most of these uh, axes actually point towards the edifice. And in fact, some are actually parallel to a previously uh, seen small dike intrusion during the last eruption. And so now I wanna take a moment to look at past studies and um, what we can learn about these really detailed 3D uh, seismicity patterns that we now have and the magmatic plumbing system. And so first of all, we think that seismicity is mainly caused by brittle failure, but that fluid-driven fracturing uh, plays a very important role. And so I've pictured in here a magmatic body that was previously derived um, from Steve Riker. And we find that our seismicity pattern, so the deepest cluster actually sit right on top of this magma uh, body. And we think this really shows the connection uh, of the deeper plumbing system to a more shallow plumbing system, where we've uh, sort of pictured this in here. Um, the seismic gap that we imaged beneath Aldonio Lengai corresponds to very low F-wave velocities in, the, in this tomography model, as well as previously found very high VPVS ratios. And we think that this part is likely a mushy zone where we see uh, heated country rock or partial melt. And we just sort of pictured in what we think this plumbing system uh, might potentially look like. Um, this shallow cluster here was uh, in the past uh, also active and interpreted to be a hot pressurized silk complex. And we think that really corresponds to these erratic T-axis that I've showed you before. And also from previous studies, um, we saw that there's a non-double non couple component from these earthquakes in the last uh, 20 or so years. You're uh, at 10 minutes now. Yep. Uh, 
So when we think further evidence for male transport or the existence of male really comes from this change in stress field. And so um, edifice loading um, here or magmatic overpressures uh, really seem to play an important role as well as um, dikes when they are inflating and transporting melt and so on. This second uh, seismic gap is somewhat more puzzling as there's no evidence currently for surface displacements or magmatic processes. And we think this likely marks an area of altered or weak host rock. Um, beneath Gilai, um, as I've showed you, um, seismicity has now migrated northward since that dike intrusion in 2007 and actually hosts now over 60% of the entire seismicity of the area, including both of these swamps that I've shown you. One of which here, the second one, is happening on a known uh, tectonic fault with deep degassing. And we think uh, likely the, the first is likely similar, but on a hidden fault. And overall, all of these uh, mechanisms that I've showed you are normal faulting and parallel to the regional extensional direction. And so coming back um, to uh, rifting, really, um, we think that our results indicate that the Southern Natron Basin is um, a segmented rift system where strain has now uh, transferred from a seemingly inactive border fault into a newly developing rift segment here beneath Gilai. So in the past, we've seen this uh, extension normal dike, and we think this injects into the rift to accommodate the regional extension and also serves to focus uh, strain into this newly developing segment, as we've seen with all these um, this, um, earthquakes, um, fluid sw driven swarms, as well as um, from the focal mechanisms. And in between these segments, we think we have an accommodation zone where we see enhanced vertical permeability and fluid migration. And so we image here a complex uh, stress field that is driven by uh, melt and uh, melt transport. And it's really these interconnected zones of magmatism that we think feed the strain transfer. And so with that, I thank you for your attention. Thanks, Miriam. That was excellent. Very fascinating um, imaging of the, of the earthquakes underneath that, that new rift system. Rich rift system developing. Uh, there is one question already in the chat from uh, Robert Winch. Would you like to ask your question directly, Robert? Uh, I can do that. Uh, you uh, you shared with us cross sections showing the depth of seismicity across the the uh, extension zone. I'd mm -hmm. be very interested to know what you think is the distribution of temperature. Are the is the bottom of the seismic zone thermally dependent? Oh, oh that's a good question. Um, I've, I don't really know. I mean, uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, the, the melt that is uh, erupted at the surface, right, the magma is quite cold, uh, comparatively speaking, um, because the carbonatites only have a temperature of, what, 400 to 500 degrees. Um, so I'm not quite sure how, how that would impact um, this. Or if that would, yeah, would look differently in different, um, if you had different melts. Okay. Thanks. There's a second question in the chat from Sarah Stamps. Would you like to unmute? Sure. Um, hi, Miriam. Hey. I was wondering if there's any evidence from the seismicity of the previous dikes that occurred in 2007 and 2008 um, yeah. contracting. Yeah, so um, what is really interesting about, about this feature here, right, that is so uh, aseismic, is that it's at an angle here. You can see it almost at the surface, right? And the previous dike, I mean, what we know from the modeling is that it was uh, actually 90 degrees to that. <laughs> uh, so I think this is very interesting. So I've been wondering actually what is happening here and if this is somehow... Uh, yeah, if this somehow goes together, though, it's at a completely different angle. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, maybe one more question uh, live and then the, the rest can go in the chat if you can answer those later, Miriam. Uh, there's one more question from Adel Mustafa. Do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I'm asking about uh, the reason for strike slip faulting shown by many of the uh, focal mechanisms in the southern area. Is there a reason for that? Uh, yeah, I mean, 
So I think that um, as we as we have a low as, as the edifice sort of low, so as, as melt uh, travels from depth to the surface, I think uh, we might see things like uh, dike inflation and then shear failures parallel to these dikes or in the walls um, of um, of the dike. And so this is then diverging from um, the regional expansion, really. So different mechanisms are at play here than, than the regional extension that is happening uh, beneath Gelai, for example. Thank you. Actually, looking at the time, we could probably handle one more question. There's one from Cynthia Ebinger. Would you like to ask your question? Miriam, um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the um, kind of a, a juxtaposition of high CO, magmatic CO2 degassing along the Western Natron border fault, but relative a -size, a weekly seismically active. Um, do you have a thought about what might be happening with the, that fault system now as, as strain migrates to the central basin? Yeah, I think it's completely puzzling, uh, actually. Also, <laughs> so good question. I don't, I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, maybe most of the, um, yeah, maybe the pathways already exist. That so no new rock is, is. I mean, no new earthquakes are needed basically while it's degassing. But I, yeah, I can only speculate. Sorry. Super. Thanks. <laughs>